I'm going to go with male because yeah. it's clothes. No, we can lie. Oh, God, I'm not going to get this right, am I? It's a good <laughs> thing there's two of us. <laughs> you have to be very calm, still. Schister somiasis, also known as bilharzia, is the second most common parasitic disease in the world after malaria. It's estimated 90% of cases occur in Africa. Schistosomiasis is caused by a trematode worm that infects people who work or play in infested water. Worm larvae, which develop in the guts of freshwater snails, enter the body through the skin, where they grow, breed and lay their eggs triggering diarrhea, stomach pain, anemia, and stunted development in children. In 2011, 243 million people were treated for the disease, which kills 200,000 a year in Africa alone. Okay, so I've been given my waders, my all-in-one all suit. Um, Sheikh, what else do I need? <laughs> Chair Tiam has been researching schistosomiasis for over 20 years. It does seem a bit odd, but we're being cautious here. But in the background, of course, the villagers, who have no option, really, in terms of using the water supply here, of course, they're completely exposed. So the contrast, it's quite stark. Chair is assessing the rate of infection in Lampsar, a village in one of the worst affected areas in Senegal, by examining the snails found in the local water supply. We have our first one, we have our first snail. La dernière poste que tu as ici, on a eu à peu près 45% d'infectés ici dans le site là. Donc c'est un site vraiment infecté quoi. Some of those most at risk are the local school children. Donc, oh, so we're measuring the most common treatment is a drug called praziquantel, but worldwide, only 10% of those that need it have access to it. But it does cure them of schistosomiasis 100%. It's 100% effective. Efficace, on peut faire effectivement efficace le traitement, mais le mieux c'est de trouver, de de parer à ça quoi, de trouver une solution, vraiment pour qu'il ne se réinfecte pas. Goes to give a sample now, urine sample, which Sheikh will take off into the lab after this. So, next trial, please. By detecting parasite eggs in urine or stool samples, Chair is comparing the rate of infection and reinfection amongst the villagers to the level of contamination of the snails in the local area. What can you see? You can tell already? That quickly? Yes, yes, yes. Many, many, many. It's like the There are almost 20 on one side. Oh, it's really sad. And these aren't just samples in a lab. You know, we took them from the children earlier. We met them. And to think, you know, you can place a face with that child that's infected. We have already treated these children, unfortunately. But there are others who are present in the village and who are much more charged or charged with the same charge. These children are at risk of suffering from grave consequences. So we have to do something as soon as possible. And this involves going back a step by tackling the snails that carry the parasite in its larval stage. You think you found it? Positive way. Oh, God, yeah. 
this is human schisto. Right. So that yes, means yes. in the site that we were collecting from, the larvae does actually carry the schisto. So what, what is the answer? Well, in any case, the treatment, we can say that the treatment is efficient for a medical curative. When you treat, you have to the individual of the villagers. But that doesn't diminish. It returns to the river, it will catch the villagers. So, it's not a definitive solution for the person. There are other forms of fight. The solution used to be this guy. The African freshwater prawn is the snail's main predator. And without snails to act as intermediary hosts, the parasite can't complete its life cycle. But today, the prawns are almost extinct in the Senegal River because of this. The Diama Dam was built in the 1980s to prevent salt water from flowing into agricultural lands. It blocked the prawns' upriver migration, disrupting their life cycle across a huge catchment area. While the snail's major predator was disappearing and the river's salinity and habitat were changing, a massive outbreak of intestinal schistosomiasis occurred in the villages upriver from the dam. In fact, it was the fastest outbreak of any disease in recorded history. Nicolas Journard works for Projet Crevette, which is trying to reintroduce the prawns to the Senegal River Basin. I'm going to introduce you to Batch. Bonjour, je m'appelle Amandine. Amandine, c'est Batch. Ça va? Yeah. Uh, tu veux aller pêcher maintenant? Oui. Est-ce qu'on peut aller avec toi? To restore the prawn population, Nicolas needs breeding stock, and that's where local fishermen like Badge come in. So, Badge, how long have you been a fisherman? Depuis 94. Avant le barrage, il y avait beaucoup de poissons, il y avait beaucoup de crevettes, mais maintenant, il y en a plus beaucoup. When Badge's father was fishing, before the dam was built, he used to catch hundreds of prawns every day. Today's haul is one fish and one prawn. So if um, Project Crevette reintroduces prawns, um, a large number of prawns, what change will that mean for you? It's a lot better for us. In general, everyone will work. Everyone, all the fish. Is there a clash between the fishermen like Baj fishing for the prawns, but Project Crevette doing so much hard work to try and to reintroduce the prawns here to fight um, schistosomiasis? Actually, no, because uh, we are using the small prawn that eat the snails in order to, to grow. And uh, Baj is inter and other fishermen are interested by fishing big prawns. But the prawns don't spread the schisto? If I eat the prawns, because I like prawns, yeah. I, I don't catch schisto. Not at all, there is no risk. Even if you eat the snakes, you will not uh, catch the disease. You can catch it only in the water, and it will go in your body through the skin. Projet Crevette plan to eventually breed the prawns in sufficient numbers to restock the river. But until then, they must fly them in from Cameroon, over 3,000 kilometers away. It's well before sunrise. I'm not usually a morning person, but this is no ordinary morning. We're the welcoming committee for the prawns. Bonjour. Bye. Bonjour. <laughs> Hello, Samaya. My name is Amandi. Tell me what you need a hand with. Before release, all 300 new arrivals need to be sexed, measured, weighed, and separated into groups, because the project is working on which combination of prawns is best at controlling the snail population. Carapace, propodus, length, and propodus weight. Okay. Ooh, wow. Come here around. Yeah. 32. Carapace, 32. Um, I'm going to go with male because it's closed. No, it's is large. No. Oh, God, I'm not going to get this right, am I? It's a good <laughs> thing there's two of us. <laughs> Females with eggs are not released, but taken to Project Crevette's hatchery to build a homegrown crop. So the ratio is three females to one male. Yeah. So maybe a little bit of jealousy there. <laughs> <laughs> so one male, one male. 
Lucky man. It is happening. <laughs> <laughs> And as you can see, it's taken a long time to do this process. It was raw daylight outside. And we've got the last one. <laughs> last one to go. Merci beaucoup. Wow. Comme ça, ça va? How many boxes okay. have we got in total? 11? 11 boxes. And now where do we go? And now we go to Lamsa village to okay. release the first bronze. Fantastic! Yeah. So how big an area is actually affected by Shisto? So the area we are talking about now, the Senegal River Basin, is, uh, is this approximately the size of the Italy. But uh, more generally speaking, Shisto is present all over the tropical countries and especially in Africa where we count 90% of the case. And uh, so it means that the research we are doing here might be applied uh, everywhere else in Africa and where we cross Shisto problems. Yes, sir. Right, I'm going to get busy and put my waders on while the boys figure out what's happening with the boxes. Okay. This looks very different from catching a goldfish bowl, you know, a goldfish at a fun fair. <laughs> the new prawns are released into enclosures where their progress, including their progress at munching through the local snail population, can be monitored. Your permission, shall we? Release? Okay. Here we go. Swim to freedom. Go forth, be brave. <laughs> oh, they seem very happy. I'm honored that you let me be part of this process. Thank you so much. And within seconds, they disappear into the murky water. <laughs> But you'll come back to monitor them. Every two days we we come back and we check the the traps that are here all around the enclosure and check if they are still alive and uh, and we also check if the, they are eating the snails. We are yes. collecting the snails. The most important job that they exactly. have. Exactly. And hopefully they will be hungry and they will eat yeah, the yeah, snails. Yeah, sure <laughs> they, they are after this long travel. Years before the germ theory of disease was developed, the Viennese physician Ignaz Semmelweis came to the startling discovery that doctors could save the lives of patients simply by washing their hands. Although he couldn't explain why hand disinfection was so effective, his research in 1847 would go on to transform the way surgery is carried out and infectious diseases are controlled today. Known locally as the savior of women, Zemmelweis initiated hand-washing policies which helped drastically reduce the mortality rate from childbed fever in the Viennese obstetrics clinics where he worked. Childbed fever, or purpural fever, is the infection of the female reproductive organs following childbirth and was a common cause of death at the time. Zemmelweis's attention was first drawn to the mortality rate of the clinics he worked at because women would beg to be admitted to the clinics run by midwives rather than those staffed by students. The women were so desperate to avoid the student clinics that they would rather give birth in the street. After looking into the mortality rate of the two clinics, he found that the student-run clinic did indeed have a much higher mortality rate from pure pearl fever, sometimes three times higher. After eliminating various factors, Zemmelweis came to the conclusion that the students carried something from the dissection rooms where they performed autopsies to the patients they examined during labor. He ordered the students to wash their hands in a solution of chlorinated lime before each examination. The mortality rate fell from 18% to 1%. Despite the success of his policy, Zemmelweis faced the wrath of the medical community. He could offer no acceptable explanation for his findings as the notion that there were germs causing disease was unaccepted 
and various doctors were offended by the insinuation that their hands were dirty. He was ostracized and ridiculed by the leading medical figures of his time and eventually driven out of Vienna. After struggling for years to promote his hand disinfection policies, Semmelweis was admitted to an insane asylum at the age of 47. He died 14 days later. Most of us view venomous animals such as snakes, scorpions and spiders as creatures to avoid. Yet scientists believe that their toxic venom could be a vast untapped resource for the development of life-saving drugs. I'm Dr. Geoff Lacey and I'm here in the south of France on the hunt for some extraordinary animals with the potential to save lives. The Venomics Project is a collaboration of venom experts from across Europe, aiming to find new drugs capable of treating conditions such as cancer, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. I'm just on my way to meet Pierre, who's one of the lead scientists involved with the Venomics Project, and him and his team are hunting for scorpions today. Hello. Hi, Geoff. Hi, Pierre. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> Pleasure. It's great. It's beautiful. Well, well yeah, isn't it? Well, should we go and... Sure, search? sure. Let's for go. The scorpions. Look for scorpions. Uh, that's a big rock. So, is it literally a case of just picking up rocks and... Absolutely, yeah, in this area to find them. Okay, here's a scorpion. Where? Oh my god, one. yeah. All right, we found them. Whoa. Okay. And this, I assume that's the yeah, bit that's... Yeah, that's the singer, yeah. This is a member of the family of scorpions that are lethal to humans. Kill, you know, thousands of people every year. Uh, in, Mor in Morocco, in Tunisia, in, 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 in Mexico. Whoa. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not very... Don't, don't, don't be nervous. <laughs> it's not going to jump you, well, It looks angry. Pierre, can you explain to me what exactly is involved with the Venomics project? Uh, Venomics is a large-scale project aiming at discovery of new drugs. Instead of using, for example, medicinal plants to, yeah. to, to look at new drugs, we're using animal venoms because they hold such a high potential and, and such a large number of uh, active molecules. Because it seems slightly incongruous that venom that's designed to hurt or kill you could potentially be the source of a life-saving drug. Yeah, but then again, a poisonous plant also has the same properties, and if you extract its compounds, one of those compounds, given at the right dosage, can actually cure you. Right, well, should we crack on with the search? We should, we should start lifting rocks. Yeah, okay, <laughs> let's go. Let's go. <laughs> the toxic proteins or peptides within venom target and interact with specific cell receptors within the body, affecting the vital functions of the heart, nervous system, blood, or other tissues. It's the targeted nature of these toxins that gives them huge potential for the development of drugs which have highly specific and effective therapeutic actions. I have the task to find a scorpion of my own. And I'm up against experts who have already found several themselves, so for my pride, I have to find one. No. Hundred rocks now. Oh my god, it's quite a big one. Starting to get a little bit frustrated. Pierre, if you're looking for worms, I found lots of them. <laughs> I found one. Nice and easy. That's it. Out you come. Don't move. Exactly. That's it. Woo. That's it. What a relief. <laughs> Congratulations. <you> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My first scorpion. Your first scorpion. The, the estimates we have currently are about 40 million molecules all together from, from all venomous animals. So we know about three to 4,000 molecules only. Basically, we're key hunters. We're, yeah. looking, we're looking, for looking for keys for the, key to, for the lock to unlock, yeah. that, that interests us. If you can find a key to the lock on the cancer cell, for example. Potentially it could be, potentially, provided there is a suitable lock or receptor. These creatures hold an immense potential for drug discovery. 
The Venomics project has laboratories in France, Denmark, Spain, Belgium and Portugal. And the aim is to source the venom of over 500 species of animals, including snakes, jellyfish, ants and cone snails. One of Pierre's partners in France is an expert in the breeding of large spiders. After you, I think. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Hi. Hi. Hello, I'm Joff. Okay, I'm Francois. Francois. Francois, nice to meet you. I'm surrounded by spiders. You're surrounded? Yeah, I'm feeling very comfortable. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> Mainly of them are belong to the family Teraphosidae, which uh, in English is bird-eating spiders. Uh, okay. Sometimes called tarantulas, but it's uh, bird-eating spiders. And here, you're breeding the, the, the spiders as well, it's not just... Uh, spiders, scorpions, to milk them, to provide uh, venom for the richards, for, for Pierre. And you milk them here? Uh, yes. Francois is closely associated with the project because he's got a unique facility. You probably have no more than four or five people in the world who can actually breed the, the spiders and milk their venom. Studying a diversity of venom will, will allow us to uncover a diversity of molecules with different properties. Dare I ask, can we, can we see some of them? This one is a huge one, as you see. A huge one. You have to be very calm, still, and breathe a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Easier said than done, okay. Okay. Ooh. That's a very large spider. Yeah. The venom is also quite potent okay. in those okay. species. <laughs> <laughs> And can we see you milking yeah. some of the spiders? Yeah, of course. Great. Good work. Let's put him to sleep. So you're applying the carbon dioxide straight to the lungs? Yes, absolutely. You can see the fangs. No, you can see the fangs. The poisonous glands are covered from muscle, and when I put some electricity, it causes the muscle to, to contract. contract and uh, expels the venom. Oh, wow. yeah, yeah. You see the venom. Fantastic. Yes, of course. She's wicked. <laughs> Pure spider venom. Pure spider venom. So Pierre, this sample of venom can now be sent to your laboratory for analysis, is that Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah, to being dried, yes. Fantastic. Okay, Geoff, so cool. let's, let's step into the lab. Thank you. So here's our facility. Ah, and here's all the... Here are some of these scorpions we collected uh, previously. We're going to extract some venom from the scorpions because we need for the project both venom and venom glands. If you want to try, you can have a go at uh, scorpion milking. Okay, yes. So I will install the scorpion in a holder and then we'll stimulate it with a, a bit of electrical current. I will first grab the scorpion gently. We're going to put him here and you're going to hold this yeah, for me. Press, okay. yeah, that's, that's fine, okay. So, so you're giving it shocks I'm giving now. shocks, okay. mild electrical current. Can you see the venom drop? Yeah. Okay, well, well that's enough to run, to run an test. analysis. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Perfectly alive. Once milked, the team separate the venom into its constituent peptides, which will then be added to a bank of molecules ready for analysis. This project has the same excitement in the fact that it is, as you say, this kind of leap into the, the unknown with such a strong chance that you'll find something of interest. You're exploring something that's never been explored. It's like going to other planets, you know. Yeah. As a scientist, intellectually extremely exciting. And the second reason for excitement is that you hope that you can make a difference one day and maybe out of all this work, get a cure for something. That's two reasons for being so enthusiastic. Very scary. These are actually used. On. Yeah, we just put a lock on it to keep them from running out because they are off the mind. Yeah. So we have to keep them on chains for probably one or two weeks, like that, or one or two days. One. Or, okay. Sometimes it, it depends on how, on the Lord. It's not me. Like I said, I'm just an instrument in the hands of the Lord. 